Released by Square Enix in 2003 on the Game Boy Advance, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance would be another installment but not direct sequel to the tactical strategy game Final Fantasy Tactics. Directed by Yuichi Murasawa and written by Kyoko Kitahara, the game bases its adventure in a fictional version of Ivalice. For story, the game features a young boy named March alongside his little brother Donid and schoolmates Ritz and Mute. While fewer missions are directly tied to story progression, the game features a significantly higher amount of optional side quests and missions that flesh out the world with a variety of smaller stories and achievements, such as liberating towns and zones, clan wars, bounties and hunts, and trading sequences. For gameplay, battles are still a turn-based format on an isometric grid, but now most battles are fought under a judge system in which the rules of engagement are declared and violations result in a penalty from a judge proctoring the battle. Defeating enemies or using recommended actions by the judge result in judge points that are used to execute special moves or combos on the map. Ability points are gained after missions and are used to learn skills from equipped gear for any of the 34 classes available in the game. The game introduces new art styles for familiar monsters, new towns and areas, and three new races, the lizard-like Banga, the dog-like Namu, and the rabbit-like Viera, all of which would later be used in Final Fantasy XII. Each race not only has exclusive classes they can change into, but natural strengths that lend well to each one. Finally, the game allows the player to continue playing even after beating the game, as well as offering multiplayer options to trade items or compete or cooperate in unique missions. There is also a non-canon alternate ending that can be earned after completing the base 300 missions. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. The game begins at a snowy schoolyard, where the new kid March, the timid Mute, and the feisty Fritz are on the same team for a snowball fight. This is March's first time encountering snow here in the town of St. Evelise, and as they play, a few of the kids seem keen to target Mute for their bullying. As Fritz steps in to stop the bullying, they also taunt her, exposing the fact that she dyes her hair pink to hide its true white color. After the fight is broken up when one kid throws a rock at Mute, Mute invites March to join him in buying a book about magic he's been eyeing, but March has to go help his sickly younger brother from a regular hospital visit. Still, he invites Mute and Ritz over to his house afterwards. As they go home together, the new friends are spotted by Mute's father Sid, who has become an alcoholic and fallen on hard times ever since his wife died. March admires how Sid seems supportive of Mute all the same, and to the side, Ritz reveals to Mute that March doesn't have a father anymore. As he gets home, March is greeted by his wheelchair-bound brother, Donid, as Ritz and Mute enter soon after. Mute shows off the mysterious book he purchased, noting it doesn't have a name that seems legible. The illustrations show off exotic and unusual races, while the group notes spell circles adorning the pages. After stating openly they wish worlds like the one in this book or the world of Final Fantasy were real, they all go home, and that night, the world suddenly dissipates into a new reality for the children. Waking up in a strange landscape, March finds himself in new clothes in an odd town. He runs into a member of the reptilian Banga race, accidentally insulting them with his surprise, but a Moogle named Montblanc suddenly intervenes, smoothing things over. The Banga then notes March is dressed like a soldier and forces him into an engagement, and upon this declaration, a judge now warps onto the scene to oversee the match. As they win the skirmish, the Banga try to violate one of the laws set for the match, and seeing this, the judge presents a red card, immediately imprisoning the offender and removing them from the fight. Seeing his confusion, Montblanc explains March is in the town of Cyril, in the country of Ivalice. March attempts to explain he's seen stuff like this in a video game called Final Fantasy, and can hardly believe this is just like it. Montblanc then takes him to the pub where he and his clan hang out, and invites March to join them until he can get things figured out. Lacking anything else to do in this world, March agrees, and notes that somehow he's able to subtly influence this world on a larger scale. As they do more missions together, Mont Blanc believes their clan is ready to participate in the Clan Wars, a friendly but competitive turf war with other clans in order to gain influence and reputation. Soon enough, March encounters Ritz, who seems pretty comfortable in their new circumstances. She's already figured out that their town has been absorbed into the world of Final Fantasy, and she's frankly okay with it and wants to stay here. She doesn't mind March wanting to return to their original world, but she voices that she won't help him with that either as she takes her leave. As he reflects, March does appreciate the amazing new things he can do and see in this world, but his heart still yearns for home. Montblanc understands, and urges him to take things one step at a time, and do what he feels is best. Later, they take a mission to put down some berserk monsters, and March wonders how they became that way. While no one knows for sure, Montblanc subscribes to the Crystal Theory, in which the palace makes the crystals they see around the land, and it's their immense power that creates wrinkles in space that has unforeseen side effects on the animals. Keeping this in mind, March attempts to spot such wrinkles, and finds himself engulfed by one soon enough. He finds himself warped within some ruins, and not far from one of the crystals he heard about. 
Wanting to learn more about its power, March hears a voice in his head from the crystal, and stepping out is a totem of Famfreet, intent to protect the crystal from March. After edging on a win, March has Famfreet explain more, and it states the crystal is what binds the world together, and now that March has defeated him, he will pledge his power to him. With that, the crystal shatters, reality bends a bit, and March sees a vision of mutant pain for just a moment. He also hears that if this world were to become undone, then another would be revealed, and March cannot help but hope but that means the real world. Meanwhile, we see Muta's royalty in this world, with his father Sid being the well-respected and powerful judge master in charge of all the judges. He notes Muta's upset at something, and Mute states he's suddenly remembered a bad memory in which he was being bullied in a snow fight, and one of the kids hit him with a rock. Recovering, he reiterates how he is a prince and ruler of his country, and his word is literal law. His mother, Queen Remedy, now comes in and consoles him, agreeing with his whims to make the law stronger. Sid warns them not to change the judicial system so easily, but Remedy interrupts him with news that one of the crystals has been destroyed. Understanding the severity of this, Sid then agrees on stricter laws and leaves to enact them. Back with March, he sees not much results from destroying a single crystal, and makes it his new goal to find and destroy all of them in hopes of going back home. However, news and awareness of the crystal spreads, as do warnings not to disturb them. Returning to town, March sees a Namu named Azel who is on the run for figuring out a way to craft anti-law cards that thwart and bypass the judicial system in battles. Judge Master Sid himself makes his entrance and quickly binds Azel with a powerful law. However, Azel then draws the exact card out of the deck that he needs and evokes his anti-law, nullifying Sid's binds and escaping with March. Safely away, Azel openly protests the increased amount of laws being pushed onto the people without reason or permission and allows March access to his store, where he trades law and anti-law cards. After time passes, March makes more progress on his crystal hunt, and again sees more visions of Mute, desperately clinging to this fantasy world, and seeing it clash with his resurfacing memories. March now sees Mute refuses to leave this world as well, mainly because this world is really Mute's dream world, where his mother isn't dead and he's in charge. It gives him some pause to think that to restore the world means crushing his friend's dreams. He encounters Ritz again, this time in a pinch, and after saving her, he soon chases another rumor of a crystal and encounters Mute's royal mage Babis, who was investigating the same. Babis picks up that March is the outsider Mute warned about, and seeks to arrest him. He openly mocks March's claims that this is an imaginary world, though March is undeterred in ending this facade. Crushing another crystal in his journey, March is caught on his way out by Babis, but the panicked cries of Mute call Babis away for now. Babis points out even if March is right and there is another world, what does it have that March doesn't have now? March has money and power here, so what is he seeking that is worth torturing Mute for? March finds himself at a loss for an answer, which angers Babis as he leaves. Returning back to his clan, Mont Blanc introduces March to his little brother Nono, who has recently built a new airship that was promptly stolen. The problem is that the thieves are hidden in a Yagd, which is a lawless zone that not even judges enter, and because judges always revive everyone at the end of an engagement, that means death there is permanent. Willing to risk it for his friend, as he too has a little brother, March succeeds in the high stakes mission, and in return Nono becomes a traveling traitor for the clan. As his clan grows in reputation, this backfires as the palace puts out a bounty on March's head, and as hungry clans come for him, March takes this as his cue to hurry up with finding the rest of the crystals. He's soon met by Ritz, who isn't here to hunt him down as she still regards him as a friend, and in return helps him out of an ambush of more headhunters. He then reveals Prince Mute is the same as the Mute they know, and she then questions him that knowing that this is Mute's dream world and he hates the real one, if he still wants to destroy it. She's surprised he wants to go back at all, pointing out that if he was given the chance to change his fate, wouldn't he? For example, would he change his little brother's condition, to which March has no immediate answer for? Turning it back to her though, March then asks why Ritz is so adamant about staying here as well, and curiously she dodges the question too. After the battle, March thanks Ritz for the assistance and hopes this doesn't put a mark on her as well, and leaves quietly. Ritz then exclaims there's always a chance she could join Mute and oppose March's path, but to the side, her clanmate Shara observes March is simply worried about Ritz as well. She mentions they have no love for the palace, so there's no reason not to help March, but Ritz confesses she doesn't want to return because of her unique white hair that's made fun of. Her own mother always seems sad to have to dye it pink every day to hide the fact that she was born with unusual hair. She's willing to let that go and live with her new friends that accept her, and can understand Mute in that aspect. Meanwhile, Mute is impatient that the hunt for March is producing no results, and March connects the dots that there is a totem up for every main race here in Ivalice, so there should be only two more crystals for him to find. Izelna comes in, making light that March's infamy is now larger than his, though he does warn him the palace is now searching each clan one by one for him. 
Looking around, he sees the judges outright imprisoning anyone that even remotely resembles himself or Montblanc. Outraged, March turns himself in while demanding the innocence to be spared, and pointing out Judge Master Sid can verify his claim. When Sid arrives, he doesn't recognize March outright, but does remember him with his out earlier, and so agrees to arrest him for further questioning. He's brought to an interrogation room, where Babis is called in to positively identify him. March explains his mission to destroy the crystals comes from wanting to return back to his original world, and Sid points out to destroy the crystals is to destroy Ivalice, as the balance of the world depends on those crystals. He forbids further pursuit of the crystals, and urges March to find another way home, or give up and accept where and who he is now. He too points out the wealth and status March has built up in this world, and the pain he is causing Mute, but March counters that this world is still just a dream, and Mute is the one that needs to stop running away from reality. All of a sudden, a dimensional seam opens up right where they are, and all three are ensnared by it. Within, Sid observes a totem within is weak and can barely defend its own crystal here, and March immediately moves to crush it even though he's outnumbered. He explains that even though he does love this world and isn't confident he wants to leave, he knows for a fact it is just a game, and an escape from the real world. He turns to Sid and questions him if he also remembers the real world, and Sid hesitates to deny it, prompting March to wonder if this is either part of Mute's dream or Sid's own as well. Babis also points out that if Mute's running away from a world where his mother is dead and where he's picked on and lives miserably, then all the more reason to protect this world from March. March argues that escapism isn't healthy for Mute, and Babis reveals that Mute himself has said that if the world is to go back, then he'll do it himself, so he is aware of reality, and March is just selfishly thinking of himself. Succeeding in fending off Babis while shattering the crystal, all three of them now see a vision from Mute's memories, wherein Sid sees himself as a deadbeat dad, and suddenly, memories come flooding back to him of the old world and how he used to be. He reflects on his bitter days since his wife died, and Mute's denial of it all, and wonders if it was Mute's wishes or his own that made him Judge Master in this world. Accepting the truth of the matter, Sid then turns and declares the judges and the palace are now separate, mentioning also that Mute should not idolize his fake version of his parents for his own good. He leaves to report this decision to the palace, and releases March and all the prisoners detained. He states March cannot be judged on the danger he does or does not present to Mute, but regardless, Mute will still come for him. For himself, judges will only serve the law alone and not become police for the palace. As word spreads quickly of the judges declaring neutrality, Sid still attempts to be a good father to Mute, though Mute takes the separation personally as abandonment. Outright rejecting Sid now, Sid takes his leave, as the queen now enters presenting a powerful boy as a replacement for Sid. She introduces the boy as Lednar Twem, whom will serve and protect Mute going forward. At the same time, Izel informs March a friend of his is starting a resistance movement against the palace and invites March to join along. March also fends off more bounty hunters and afterwards finds it awfully suspicious that someone knew where he was to set him up, and feels someone is watching him. Soon enough, however, he accidentally runs into his younger brother Donid here in Ivalice, though without saying anything, Donid quickly turns and flees from March, telling bounty hunters where he is. March can't find a lead back to Donid, though he's confused at the sudden betrayal right after their reunion. He's quickly interrupted by Lednar, who wastes no time rushing to strike down March, even though a seam opens up around them both. Just in time, Sid dashes in to bind Lednar, and urges March to leave now, as he cannot defeat Lednar at this time. March refuses to go when the fifth and final crystal is right in front of him, and maneuvering around Lednar, he agrees this invincible foe is beyond him. Lednar prepares again to strike March, but this activates Sid's trap card, imprisoning Lednar and sending him away. Now before the last crystal, Sid accompanies March, during which the Totemo within takes the forms of his friends and brother, each appealing to March to stay in this world like they each want to. Not fooled by the illusions, March stays the course, defeats the final Totemo, and shatters the last crystal. However, to his surprise, nothing happens, and immediately, Queen Remedy appears to explain that even without the threads binding the world together, it will continue to exist as long as it is wanted. She even points out that it's not just Mute, but March himself is not firm in his heart just yet to let this world go. As they leave the seam, Sid asks March what he'll do next, and March replies he'll go talk to Mute personally, knowing Mute stays within the heart of his palace. In town, he hears in a few days is Audience Day, in which anyone with a good enough gift can be granted audience to the royals in the palace, and March sees his opportunity. While preparing his gift, he helps out Ritz some more while keeping in the back of his mind how he'll convince her to leave this world. He once again runs into Donid, who steals his gift materials from March, and March finds a time to confront his brother. Donid outright refuses to go back to his weak handicapped self in the other world, and is upset at March for overlooking that. Donid runs again, claiming March was the one with everything, 
but to himself, March doesn't believe he was, and knows Dawn had always had something he never did. Salvaging his gift, March successfully enters the palace, but walks right into a trap ready for him by the palace after Dawn had tipped them off. To his surprise, Babis warps in and prevents March's capture, explaining he'll take March to Mute himself. He says he's not doing this to help March, but rather to help Mute by allowing him to better understand the other world and what Mute is thinking, and March is the key to that. Mute is not pleased to see March, and shouts to him to just go home by himself. March says he already tried that and it didn't work, since a part of him wants to be in this world too. Summoning his mother for support, the Queen appears and teleports them both away, while bringing Lednar in to deal with March. Babis asks March to stall for time while he gets Sid and follows Mute, and dodging the powerful foe as best he can, Sid comes in to chase away Lednar. March asks who Lednar really is, and Sid replies he is Mute, or more precisely, the violent, dangerous aspect of himself that was created for self-defense, much like the Totemus for the Crystal. With that, March decides they should split up, as Babis and Sid look for Mute, and March will set out to convince Donnan and Fritz, and even himself, to let go of this world. To the public, the royal family has taken a private vacation, and for himself, March takes a mission he knows Donnan won't be able to resist sabotaging in order to lure him out. It works, and Donnan again refuses to listen to March telling him to return home. March instead opens his heart, and reveals to his brother that in the other world, he doesn't have everything, because it was never about him. He had to give up all his personal wants and don't wants to Donid, who was never refused things because of his condition. If Donid wanted something, March had to deal with it. Their mother had to spend all her time and money on Donid, so March knew he couldn't ask for anything even if he wanted to. Ever since their parents split up, Donid is the one that got all the attention, and March was always alone, and deep down, Donid knows that's true. Even if they return back to their world, March doesn't believe Donnan will lose the freedom and companionship he's found here, and will help him get better one day. Donnan then breaks down in tears and hugs March, apologizing for himself as the two brothers finally reach an understanding. United together, Donnan is now helping March, and they now receive word of Mute's whereabouts from Sid, who wants to meet up with him first. He explains that before they make a move on Mute, they need to help Izel make a powerful anti-law, though he's prepared to face the consequences of being a judge and using an illegal item like that. Unknown to them, Ritz was following March and overhears their intentions. She then plants herself firmly in his way, calmly announcing she will not allow March to progress any further, it isn't up for discussion, and she will fight him if necessary. March understands her determination, and answers with his own. March calls her out, saying that deep down, she knew things had to go back to normal eventually, and she admits that's true, as all games have to end and that's part of the fun. Still, it doesn't mean she has to like it or take it lying down, and so she'll fight. As the two friends duel for their ideals, March earns the win, and afterwards asks her again if she'll come with him though she politely declines. He then asks if she'll hate him for restoring things, and she says she won't, and there won't be any hard feelings, but she simply just wants to stay here is all. As March turns to leave, Ritz observes how much more stronger and mature March has grown since coming here, and wonders why she hasn't had the same internal changes. As more time passes, the palace decides to reconcile with the anti-law wielding resistance with Izel overseeing the treaty process, and the palace and judges now legalize anti-laws and their limited use by the citizens. As thanks for helping make his life easier and life's work an important part of the world, Izel joins March's clan, though that doesn't mean a shop discount. Soon after, he catches up to Sid, who leads him to where Mute is. On the way, they're surprised to find Babis knocked unconscious and Lednar stepping out, preventing them from moving on. March stands his ground, and seeing this, Sid pulls out his custom anti-law, and uses it to even the playing field, nullifying all laws that protect Lednar from the fortune card that the Queen bestowed on him. No longer invincible, a normal skirmish breaks out, and with this, March shows the progress he's made since their last battle, and wins a definitive victory against Lednar, who turns to stone and shatters. Reviving Babis, he's still too injured to move on and so wishes them well, though Beyond is not mute, but instead Queen Remedy. She states that while it's true this world is an illusion, the person March has become here pursuing his dreams is the real him. March dismisses that, claiming there's only one him, regardless of what he's done or desired. He states Mute is the one in conflict on who he wants to be, and demands to speak to him. Mute now appears, and the Queen asks if Mute wants her to leave, and desperately he clings to her again before disappearing once more. Now adopting a battle form, Remini summons dark versions of the Totema to her side, and states she is the fulfiller of wishes, and if Mute wishes to stay, she will make it happen. Both sides clash, though March wins against the illusory queen, now urging Mute to listen to him. Mute states he's still torn on wanting to go back home, 
and wanting things to stay nice like they are here. In this hesitation, Remedy now stands up, assuming her true form as the pure essence of every wish that makes up this world, the Legrim. As they fight, March realizes he cannot beat Remedy for good until Mute stops desiring this world, asking his friend for help again as they do their best to defeat the ascended form of the entity behind his dream world. As Remedy and Mute disappear at the end of the battle, elsewhere, Ritz is outside and notes it starts spontaneously snowing, just like on the day when everything changed. She isn't completely ready for it, not wanting to go back to white hair, even though she loves the hair of her Viera clan. However, Shara points out the Viera have white hair because they are loved by the spirits, so for Ritz it must be the same, so it really is a point of pride. Even if she was chosen, Ritz dislikes the negative reaction from everyone, but she's reminded that she's tough, so she'll be alright. Shara also mentions that her being sad is likely what made her mother sad, not just her being born with white hair, so try laughing and seeing if that changes anything. As March, Sid, and Montblanc return to Vabis, Mute now speaks to them all that he'll be there soon. Arriving with a grimoire in hand, Mute states he had to take a moment to say goodbye to his mother, but he's fine now. His acceptance of wanting to return home means she won't be coming back, but March reminds him she'll always be in his heart. As Mute presents the book for them to return with, March turns to Montblanc to thank him for being such a good friend since the beginning. Wondering if Ivelisse will remain even if they go, Sid believes it will, as long as the people here in this world wish for it. Firmly saying goodbye, March ends his adventure here in Ivelisse as the world shifts back as quickly as it came. As the game ends, life is indeed back to normal for the town of Ivelisse. We see Ritz walking confidently with her hair worn naturally, passing by Sid, who is approached by his old subordinate Biggs, who runs his own company now and now wishes to offer a major position to him. We then see Donnit making friends and socializing like normal. Finally, we see March and Mute, still being picked on by schoolyard bullies, but the bullies soon find out they can't stand up to the new force of will and strength from the new friends. As children who have lived a lifetime of battles in a day, March, Mute, Ritz, and Donid continue their quiet lives with new hope for the future. Final Fantasy Tactics Advance has enjoyed the success of selling over 2.1 million copies worldwide.